welcome from St. Paul's Cathedral to a rather different local heroes. I've told the stories of about 150 pioneers of science and invention, and so far, almost all of them have been men, which means that either there aren't many women pioneers out there, or I haven't found them. So a little while ago, I asked you, the viewers, whether there are any local heroines you would like to see in the series. And as a result, this week, I've come to London, where all my heroes are women. I'm on my way to Hunter Street in London's West End to celebrate my first heroine, whose work was inspired by a seller of ice cream. She was then professor at what was the London School of Medicine for Women, and her name was Mary Waller. Mary Desiree Waller had a good scientific pedigree. Her father had invented the electrocardiogram and a lie detector, so she probably never got away with any childhood fibs. She started as a demonstrator in physics in 1912, and her rise was meteoric. By 1915, she was head of department. But the real breakthrough came in 1932, when a man came to the door of the building to sell ice cream. Now, he used to use dry ice to keep his ice cream cold, and he came to her with a question. He said, when I take a piece of dry ice, a curious thing happens when I touch it on the bell of my bicycle. Ah, let's just try this. It's funny stuff, dry ice. It's actually frozen carbon dioxide gas. And it's called dry ice because if you let it warm up, it doesn't leave a puddle. Ordinary ice, when you melt it, it leaves a puddle of water. But if you look at this stuff, and you can actually see the gas coming off it, and, but it never gets wet. It stays dry, dry ice. Mary realized that the noise must be produced as a result of the gas coming off the dry ice. When she touched it on the metal, the gas pushed the dry ice away from the metal and then it bounced back as soon as the gas escaped. And because it was going very quickly, it was bouncing up and down and making the metal ring. This is the very building where she did all her research on vibrations and sound. And in order to see the vibrations she was studying, she used a trick invented in 1787 by a German lawyer called Ernst Kladny. What he did was to sprinkle sand on metal plates and then make them vibrate like this. And so generate some rather beautiful patterns. So I'm just sprinkling a bit more sand on here. And I'm going to bow this with her bow. Look, as her name on it. It's a double bass bow for this great heavy plate. And just watch what happens here. The patterns are made because the sand bounces off the parts of the plate that vibrate and settles in the places where the plate is perfectly still. But she realised there was a bit of a problem because these plates were always bolted down in the middle, which meant that the middle of the plate couldn't vibrate. So she began to look for other ways of doing it. And here is one. Here is a round brass plate with sand already on it, and it's quite free, and I'm going to put it down on these three corks, so it's just sitting on those, and there's a bit of sand underneath as well. And then in order to make that vibrate, I'm going to bash it with this little wooden hammer. One, two, three. Very, very pretty. These are the actual brass plates that Mary had cut for her research. Now, after her encounter with the ice cream vendor in 1932, she realised that dry ice might actually be even better than the hammer. The point is, first, that you can apply it much more precisely because it's got a narrow point, but second, it actually drives the plate because it goes on vibrating. It's not just one bash, continuous series of bashes. And this brass plate here is a sort of diamond shape and it's balanced on some little feet. Just a look at that, a really beautiful pattern. And the other wonderful thing about the dry ice is it's so precise, you can apply it in different places to the plate, and sometimes you get different patterns. So let me just try over here. Wow, almost immediately. I got a different note, and I got a different pattern in the sand from the very same plate. 
Mary's work had a serious application. Studying these patterns allowed her to predict the effect of vibrations. Her knowledge was used to help design the jet engine, which until then had had a habit of shaking itself to pieces. In 1938, she appeared on BBC television with her vibrating plates and dry ice. Mary Waller went on doing research until 1952. She published a whole string of papers about the viscosity of liquids when they boil and the heartbeats of a frog. But what I'll remember her for is the wonderful research she did on vibrations sparked off by an ice cream salesman right here in Hunter Street. I've come to Tulse Hill, south of Brixton, to celebrate a remarkably skilled astronomer and photographer. Although she always worked with her husband and he wrote their joint papers, she was almost certainly the first person in the world to prove that the Orion Nebula is a cloud of gas. And she did it by using chemistry through space. Her name was Margaret Huggins. Margaret Lindsay Murray was born in Dublin in 1848. She spent a lot of time with her grandfather, who was familiar with the stars and taught her about the constellations. By the time she met William Huggins, she was an accomplished amateur astronomer. This is the back garden of 90 Upper Tulse Hill, and this was the very site where they had their observatory. The house must have been a bit different then, but when she married William in 1875, this was where they came to do their work. Now, she brought to their professional working relationship two important skills. The first was astrophotography, taking photographs of the stars, which is very difficult, I know, I've tried it. And the second was spectroscopy, and that means looking at spectra. I've got here a prism, and if I hold it in the sunlight, I can cast a spectrum of sunlight on the door frame of the Wendy house over there. You see, complete colours of the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Now, what's interesting about spectra is not just that they're pretty, but also they tell you about chemistry. This is particularly important if you look at the spectra of heavenly bodies, because then you can find out about the chemistry of the stars. The colours you get in a spectrum depend on the light you start with. Our sun is a star and it emits white light, which can be split by the prism into all the colours of the rainbow. But where do the colours come from? This is a spectroscope. It's basically a mix between a telescope which collects the light and a prism which spreads the light, just like the one in the back garden. And then a second tube here with an eyepiece at this end, so I can look through and see the spectrum. I'm going to look at the spectrum of a flame from a wick soaked in salt. When they get very hot in a star or a flame, for example, chemical elements emit light of characteristic colours. The sodium in the salt gives off yellow light, like in sodium street lamps. The sodium spectrum is very simple, just a pair of yellow lines. But because there are lots of elements being burned in the sun, we see a continuous spectrum of colours. She's best known for her work on the Orion Nebula. You can see Orion any clear winter evening. You go up and look into the night sky and you see the great hunter there. He looks a bit like this. This is his head and his arms and his belt and his sword and his legs or feet. He's drawn various different ways. But the one we're interested in is the middle star of the sword. And if you look at that with a small telescope or even a pair of binoculars, you need to hold them very steady, you'll see that this one is surrounded by what looks like a sort of fuzzy cloud. And that is the Orion Nebula. Unfortunately, there isn't a lot of night sky about at the moment, so I brought my own along. This is an inflatable planetarium. The constellations that fill the night sky can be projected onto the inside wall. Now, here are the three stars of the sword. One, two, three. And you'll see that the middle one is surrounded by a sort of fuzzy cloud. And to begin with, nobody had any idea what these things were. And they were called nebulae after the Latin, meaning cloud. It, it looks as if it could be mist or something like that. The Herschels had observed many nebulae and thought that some of them were clusters of stars. The Earl of Ross had built the world's biggest telescope in Ireland 
and could actually see the spirals of stars in the hearts of various nebulae. But Margaret thought it was something quite different, and so it was on this Orion Nebula that she trained her telescope and examined the light with her spectroscope. If the Orion Nebula consisted of stars, its spectrum would be made up of lots of colours like the spectrum of our Sun. All Margaret saw with her spectroscope was a single bright green line. She realised that the Orion Nebula couldn't be made up of stars but was in fact a cloud of hot gas. Margaret was quite cheerful about the attitude towards women in science. She herself said in 1905, I find that men welcome women scientists provided they have the proper knowledge. Margaret Huggins clearly had the proper knowledge and she used it to show that the Orion Nebula, which is 1,500 light years from Upper Tulse Hill, was a cloud of hot gas. This is one St Paul's churchyard under the shadow of the cathedral, where 150 years ago, William Dakin and Sons had a tea and coffee business. And it was right here that in 1848, Elizabeth Dakin invented the cafetiere. Almost nothing is known of Elizabeth Dakin. In 1841, she married William Dakin. He sold tea and coffee at number one St Paul's churchyard, so it's not a great surprise she was interested in making coffee. Coffee all began in tropical Ethiopia, where this plant, Coffea arabica, thrives in the high altitude rainforests. It was first cultivated by Arab merchants who introduced it to the port of Mocha in the Yemen in about the sixth century. It didn't get to Europe for another thousand years, but when it did, it was an instant success with the aristocracy. Now the important bit of it is the bean here. And it's full of proteins and caffeine and sugars and all the other things, but unfortunately it doesn't taste of anything when it's fresh. So in order to get the wonderful taste in that cup of cappuccino, the first thing you need to do is roast it. Elizabeth Dakin reckoned that you shouldn't use just an old iron roaster because the iron would impart noxious qualities to the delicate flavor of the coffee. She suggested that the roaster should be lined with gold or silver or platinum. I reckon hers must have been the most expensive coffee in London. However you do it, when you get it right, it's like this. Oh, that's wonderful. Smell that. Those are all those terrific aromatic oils. But smelling them isn't enough. You, you really want to be able to drink the stuff. And if you're going to drink it, you've got to extract those lovely flavors into water. The simplest way to do this is to grind the beans and add hot water. Hmm, it tastes all right but there are a couple of problems. The first is, it's full of bits, all the grounds are still in there, and there's no way of getting rid of them because they're all floating about in the water. And the second is that the coffee in the pan goes on brewing. I'm told that the perfect cup of coffee brews for about four minutes. But obviously anyone who comes along later is going to get coffee that's all stewed and got all the horrible bitter bits that come out later on. When Elizabeth Dakin took out her first patent for apparatus for making infusions and decoctions of coffee in 1848, she addressed both of these problems. Her first invention was a pot with a bag in it made of linen or cotton connected to a simple handle. You put your ground coffee in the bag and added hot water. And then, after four minutes, when it's nicely brewed, you simply wind the handle. And what happens is the bag squeezes up, you see? And that means that all the water is squeezed out and it has two important effects the grounds are squeezed out of the water so that you don't get grounds when you drink it and bits in your mouth. And also, the water is squeezed out of the grounds so it doesn't go on brewing. But then she went one further and went high tech. And what she produced was this. You see there's a metal strainer and you put your coffee in here and that's all sitting in the bottom and in the top there is a plunger down here, the black thing, which is on a screw. So as you turn the handle at the top the plunger will push down. Now, you put the whole of this lot into your coffee pot, which has got the hot water in it. Like that. And then, you leave it for four minutes for its perfect brewing, and then you put your handle on top, and now it's very simple. All I need to do is wind the plunger down 
until it squeezes all the water out of the coffee and then I'm ready to pour myself a perfect cup. There, look at that. Not a ground in sight. Ah, not bad at all. I guess that that's almost as good as the coffee made 150 years ago by Elizabeth Dakin. I've come to the Royal Institution in Albemarle Street to celebrate a heroine who was so influenced by the lectures she heard here that she went on to open up for women the entire world of chemistry. Her name was Jane Marseille. She was born Jane Holdemant, the daughter of a Swiss banker, and she had an unusual education. She learned mathematics, astronomy and philosophy alongside the usual music, dancing and fine arts. At the age of 30, she married Alexander Marseille. Chemistry was strangely popular at the time and became the couple's favourite topic of conversation. She came to lectures at the Royal Institution with her husband and was absolutely fascinated, especially by the chemistry books given by the great Humphrey Davy, the first of the great demonstrators. She wanted to find out all about chemistry but was disturbed to discover there simply wasn't a good book on the subject, so she resolved to write her own. She worked on it through two pregnancies, and when it came out, it was so good it had a profound influence on the young Michael Faraday, who went on to become the greatest demonstrator of them all. And this is it. This is her book in two slim volumes, published originally in 1805. And this is actually the second edition. So there we are, 1806, the second edition. And it says in the front, presented to the library of the Royal Institution by the author. But her name doesn't appear on the title page. She was worried that other people would think it inappropriate that a woman should write a book about chemistry, and so it was published anonymously. And this was the book that so influenced Michael Faraday. He was a bookbinder from the age of 13 and had found two books especially interesting. One was the Encyclopaedia Britannica, and the other was Mrs. Marseille's Conversations in Chemistry, which gave me my foundations in that science, hence my deep veneration of Mrs. Marseille. This is 23 Russell Square in the West End of London. It's where Jane Marseille lived, and it's now the School of Oriental and African Studies. Jane's book was designed to teach through demonstrations. It was cast in the form of a series of conversations between a tutor, Mrs. Bryan, and her two pupils, Emily, the industrious one, and the reluctant Caroline. One of the first experiments in the book is what she describes as a simple example of chemical attraction. Following the instructions from Jane Marseille's book, I've put some nitric acid into a glass and just look what it does to this copper wire. It takes a little bit of time to get going, beginning to fizz, and the solution is going a sort of bluey green. As a chemist, I'd say that what's going on is the nitric acid is reacting with the copper to make copper nitrate. Emily put it rather more poetically. She said, nothing can be more striking than this example of chemical attraction. Emily was talking about the attraction between the copper and the nitrogen and oxygen in the acid. So now I've got a solution of copper nitrate, but that isn't the end of the experiment, because what she suggested then was to put in a piece of iron, and I've got a little iron bar, so I put that in there, this, and again it fizzes like mad, and within a few seconds, I should be able to take this out, there. That should do it, I think. Now, just wipe off some of this acid. And now, if you look carefully, you can see that this iron bar has actually been coated with copper. Mrs. B gives a complicated explanation of this in terms of chemicals A, B and C, but Emily again puts it more poetically. She says, 
one might think of the comparison of two friends who were very happy in each other's society till a third disunited them by the preference one of them gave to the newcomer. The book was an instant success and went to 16 English editions in her own lifetime. 50 years on, it had sold over 160,000 copies in America alone. She wrote all her life and published a total of 34 books. She always said she wanted to die in London, and she did just that at the age of 89 in 1858 in Stratton Street, off Piccadilly. This is King's College London. It was here in 1951 that a young researcher began one of the key scientific investigations of the century. Her work opened the instruction manual of every living thing on this planet and her name was Rosalind Franklin. Rosalind Elsie Franklin was born into a modern thinking and wealthy family. Her father devoted his life to working with the poor and her uncle spent six weeks in prison for taking a dog whip to Winston Churchill. This is the chapel at King's College. Rosalind Franklin inherited the family tray of questioning everything. As a child, she read right through the Bible, looking for a reason to believe in God. And when she'd finished, she said, how do we know that he isn't she? She studied at Cambridge and after the war went to Paris where she became an expert in X-ray crystallography. When she came here in 1951, her job was to find out the arrangement of the atoms in DNA. Although they knew little about it, scientists at the time thought that DNA may carry the genetic code from one generation to the next. DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, to give it its full name, is the stuff that makes us what we are. People think it's magical, mysterious, but actually it's fantastically easier to extract. You can do it in your own kitchen. The best thing to start with is kiwi fruit. And what you need to do is to chop that up and sort of pulp it a bit like that. And then you put the pulp in a bowl. And to extract the DNA, you need to make up a cocktail of salt and washing up liquid. I've made up a bit of cocktail here and I'm going to slop that into my kiwi fruit. Then warm that up in a pan full of hot water. This is about 60 degrees, just about put my fingers in it. And leave it there for about 15 minutes. If you filter out the chunky bits, you're left with a solution of DNA. Now I've probably got just about enough there, so I'll take the extra bit off put that out of the way and the next stage is to tip onto the top very carefully some ice cold methylated spirits I don't want the layers to mix I want this to settle on top the cold methylated spirits draws the DNA out of its watery solution that should be enough And now the place to look is between the two layers. You can see there's a little bit of white milky stuff on top of the white layer, below the purple layer. And that white stuff is DNA. And if I'm lucky, I might be able to hook it out with this bit of wire. I'm looking for just thin strands. And look at that, those are strands of DNA extracted from a kiwi fruit. Now, in the early 1950s, they were fairly sure that this stuff was involved in the process of passing on genetic information from one generation to another, the colour of the eyes and the hair and so on, but they didn't know how. And what they hoped was if they could find out the shape of the molecules of this, they would understand how it worked. If she'd been able to use a microscope and simply look at her DNA and see where all the atoms were, it would have been easy. 
But unfortunately, you can't do that with a microscope. There isn't enough resolving power to see individual atoms. So she had to use a trick. And what she did was to use a beam of X-rays. Now, if you shine a beam of X-rays at a crystal, what comes out the other side is a disturbed beam. And that was what she was working with. Here, I've got a laser. And it produces a beam like this. And if I put in my unknown substance, you can see that that beam gets disturbed. It comes out in the form of a pattern of dots, a sort of X-shaped pattern of dots. That doesn't correspond to the positions of the atoms in here, but it is related to it, because every different crystal you put in here, you get a different pattern of dots. In 1952, Franklin took the famous X-ray of DNA that solved the puzzle. After months of complex calculations, she began to nail down the positions of the atoms that caused that X-shaped pattern. She concluded that the atoms in DNA must be arranged in a helix, like a corkscrew. By January 1953, Franklin had virtually worked out the whole structure. She'd realized that it wasn't just a single helix, but a double one, that all the important bits were on the inside, and she'd even worked out their precise dimensions. And then she was pepped to the post by two chaps from Cambridge. James Watson, a 25-year-old American, and Francis Crick were doing their own work on DNA. They seemed to be on the wrong track until one of Franklin's colleagues, Maurice Wilkins, showed Watson her X-ray picture of DNA. This was the piece of the puzzle that they needed. This is the structure of the DNA molecule. It's the most wonderful thing. You can see it's a double helix. If you look at these red atoms up the outside, they're actually the backbone that holds the whole thing together. And I should point out that it's enormously long. If it were really as wide as this, it would go, well, I reckon, to the North Pole. It's absolutely huge. Now, it's the inside which carries the vital information for the genetic code. These are the bases, and they're arranged between the bits of the backbone like this. And they can be arranged in any order you like. They're like the letters of the alphabet of the genetic code. With an immensely long molecule and all those letters, you can actually have all the information you need to describe the human being that you actually are. Would Rosalind Franklin have worked out the structure of DNA on her own? She was so nearly there. Was it that she needed a little more vision or just a little more time? Unfortunately, she didn't have much more time because in 1958, she died of cancer. In 1962, Watson, Crick and Wilkins shared a Nobel Prize for their work on DNA. But Nobel Prizes aren't awarded posthumously, so Rosalind Franklin didn't get one. I'm sorry, that's all the local heroines. See you next time. If you would like to try some experiments from the programme, to visit some heroic sites, or just find out more about my heroes, details are on the Local Heroes website at www.bbc.co.uk slash education. And there's more next week at 8. Coming up next tonight on BBC Two, Food and Drink.